justice. How about the landlord didn't get his money, where's his justice? Okay. But then the next thing says love mercy. Love mercy. Mercy means that I show forgiveness. And the problem I have with this verse, I, do, I can't do both. Pick one. I'm either going to be hard-nosed, legalistic, by the book, insist that everybody does what's right or gets what's coming to them, or I'm going to love mercy, let everybody get away with everything. It doesn't matter. You, you slap me, I smile. Okay? And, and the, the issue, this is the conflict with our, our human nature. And it comes because we're made in the image of God. Um, a, a friend of mine used to always say, I'll forgive you for, for running over my foot, but next time I see you, I'm getting up on the curb. <laughs> you know, And we'll, we'll deal with that a little bit later. So um, what I have today is basically three reasons for forgiveness, three ways of dealing with it. And, of course, being shown how to do something from the Bible is worthless unless we're given the power to do it, right? So I always find it's very cruel for a pastor to say, the Bible says do this, now do it. God bless you, goodbye. You know, because being told to do it doesn't solve my problem. I must be given the power to do it. So let's look at Genesis 45. Genesis 45, this is after Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers. So we're familiar with this story. Joseph, kind of a bratty younger brother, he walks around, he has crazy dreams, he tells everybody that he's everybody's favorite. <laughs> I'm daddy's favorite, I'm God's favorite, and and oh, by the way, you guys are lost, and um, you need to do what you're supposed to do. And, you know, older brothers are sick of him. And that's the story. They, they decide to kill him. Then before they decide to leave him for dead, they decide to make some money off him. They sell him as a slave. He goes off to Egypt. They count their cash. Then they have to put some blood on his garment to lie to their dad because they... Obviously, they're not going to tell their dad that they sold him, or as good as dead. So, let's look at Genesis 45, verse 8. Now, you can imagine that when Joseph reveals himself to his brothers, his brothers were very, very nervous. We know from the entire narrative that they were racked with guilt. They saw every bad thing that came their way as God's judgment on them. They had had many years, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe a good 20, 30 years to live with the fact that they had done a horrible crime and no one ever found out about it, okay? So they're very upset. Let's go back to verse 5, 45, 5. Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me ahead of you to save life and preserve our family. And then verse 8, this is where Joseph basically says something that's not true. Or is it? Verse 8, so now it was not you who sent me here, but God. Let's think about that for a minute. He's looking at his brothers. His brothers did horrible things to him. They rejected him. Abused him. Mocked him sold him, and just washed their hands of him. He's gone. And whatever happened to him, they didn't know what was going to happen to him, but in their minds, he's just, you know, he's a nothing slave in Egypt for the rest of his life. Imagine you're Joseph, and your siblings did that to you. I mean, it's not like they just locked, her, locked you in the basement for a couple days, or, <laughs> or sent you off to live with grandma and didn't talk to you. This is serious, this is abuse, and you're the one that's the victim here. Joseph has every right to practice 
law. He has every right to say, you guys are guilty, and now you're going to pay. And his brothers know that he has every right to do that. How can Joseph forgive? He says, you didn't send me here. God did. He says, who do you think you are? You can't upset God's plan. Why does Joseph forgive? Now, in, even in the world, a friend of mine in college used to always say, forgiveness is the best revenge. I was an atheist. But his attitude was, well, if you forgive somebody, then um, they stop hurting you. We, heard, we hear that, and it, it's, it's true. It's worldly wisdom in a sense, you know. You slap me, and you hurt me once. If I spend the next 10 years angry about that slap, you're hurting me again. I'm allowing you to continue to hurt me over and over. Uh, people talk about people, others living rent-free in your head, right? If I am bitter towards you for what you've done to me, I'm compounding the original hurt you gave me. That's practical. So if I say I'm going to forgive you just to solve my own problems, that's a little selfish. It kind of works. Okay, I'm just going to forgive you, and now the weight is clear on my head. But if I forgive you with that type of attitude, in the back of my mind, I can still feel a little dirty. I say, I didn't really uphold justice. Somewhere in, the, in my mind, it's like, they got away with it. And I, I, I haven't resolved my problem. Yeah, I've done a nice psychological trick. But I haven't really answered the question, why should I forgive? Forgiveness still isn't quite wrong. Proverbs 25, 21, 21 to 23 says, If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head and the Lord shall reward thee. We've all heard Christians say, I'll forgive him, because if I forgive him, God will get him. If I forgive him, I'm going to heap coals of fire on his head. That's right. Yeah, I'll teach him. Yep, I forgive you. I'm going to get on the curb when you drive towards me, but I'll forgive you. The forgiveness isn't... It hasn't accomplished what we were told to do. Love justice, love mercy. If I give mercy, I'm really turning my back on justice. Okay, I'll forgive you. I'll let it go. Being made in the image of God means that I have a, a need or desire to do both. We've heard the phrase, God doesn't wink at sin, right? And we know the reason he doesn't have to do that is because he paid for sin. And his full payment for sin, justice is satisfied, and now he is now free to demonstrate mercy. So, reason number one for Joseph to be able to forgive is that he has gotten to know God well enough to believe all things work together for good. I can forgive them because my God is able to work around all their evil deeds and come up with some sort of plan. God has a plan. And Joseph, I mean, he functioned by faith, but by the time he's telling his brothers this, he doesn't need faith. He's seen the famine. He sees that he is in Egypt for a reason. He is in Egypt for such a time as this. And he knows that, I mean, he can see it by sight now. Yeah, you brothers, you did something wrong. My God is so great. He planned for that. He worked around that. He had a need to make sure that when this famine come, came far into the future, there'd be someone here to make sure that family lived. And why is that family so important? That's Abraham's family. That's the family that God promised to make a great nation out of. That family, during the famine, is living in Canaan. That family is going to be facing the biggest problem of starting a new nation, and that is um, 
becoming part of Canaan. That family can't turn into a nation. That family is going to slowly become absorbed into the Canaanite culture and eventually that family is going to disappear. That family needs a way of being protected, isolated, until it can be a nation. And so, if Joseph's brothers hadn't done what they did, they wouldn't have come to Egypt and then eventually settled in Egypt and been given a spot in Egypt where that family turned into a nation. Egyptians despised shepherd. There was no problem with um, intermarriage or other issues like there was back in Canaan. By the time they came out, they were a nation. They were like an incubator there. And God rescued them. So, we can forgive because God has a bigger plan. I step out of faith, I forgive. God's going to use this. Yeah, that guy stole my inheritance. God can restore it. God can give it back. God has a reason for allowing that to happen. Yeah, that person slapped me. Yeah, that person you know, took my toys. That person, just you know, pick your favorite grievance, the thing that set you off the most, and realize that when God allows this to happen, you can forgive because God's going to use it. God's going to you know, Satan means it for evil, and God will use it for good. So, let's turn to Matthew 18. This is a very famous parable here. But we're going to look at additional reasons to forgive. We haven't really talked about how we're going to forgive yet, or how we're going to totally resolve this. Matthew 18, let's look at verse 21. <clears throat> so Jesus has been talking about how important forgiveness is. And verse 21, Peter comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? How about seven times? Peter is being precocious. He's also... Um, hoping to get some brownie points from Jesus. <laughs> He's saying, if he does something bad to me, I'll forgive him once. If he does it a second time, maybe I'll forgive him the second time. And he's saying seven. He's a good Jewish guy. He knows that it's a number of completion. <laughs> so he's saying, Jesus, how about I'm going to give, give that guy seven chances. Okay, and it does it seven times. I want to forget up to seven times. Aren't I good, Jesus? Where's my pat on the back, Jesus? I got your message now. I'm going to, you know, I fool me once, fool me twice, fool me six times, seven times. Yeah, after the seventh time, I'm sure Jesus will fully understand if on, if he does it the eighth time, it's all over, right? It says, hey, Jesus. I'm going to do it seven times, okay? Make me your number one guy for the day. Give me my gold star. And Jesus says, I say to you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Like, and at that point, it becomes a number. I mean, there's no way Peter says, okay, 490, here we go. Um, it's, just, it's just, you're going to keep doing it. Forgiveness is a lifestyle. It is an attitude here. And then Jesus explains how you can do it. Okay, one method of how you can do it is just, okay, God has a bigger plan. Method number two, verse 23. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king who took account of his servants, and he began to reckon. One was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had nothing to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, all that he had, and payment to be made. Okay, that's what kings do. You owe me money. If you don't give me my money, something bad is going to happen. Right? In the modern era, we break kneecaps. Back then, <laughs> they, they, they just took out the family. We're going to get our money one way or the other. Okay? So apparently, he calls this servant in and says, You're done. You're toast. You owe me this money. 
I'm tired of waiting. Give me my money. And the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. That's what everybody says when they owe money. Everybody's lying. Okay? So we're talking about $25 million here, okay? You owe me $25 million. You ever notice that when you owe the bank two or $3,000, you're in big trouble? If you own $25 million, then, then they give you loans, right? <laughs> yeah, if you feel like you're in horrible, and you're really big debt, they'll do whatever they can to get their money. That's a separate issue. <laughs> so, um, this person owes big money. And it says, Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. So, we all know this story in the sense that, yes, this is God forgiving this person a monstrous debt. And later on, spoiler alert, he gets upset with someone who owes him next to nothing. But here's a weird question. How does this king have the right to forgive him that debt? Now, this is a monetary debt, but what if it was a debt like a crime? Okay? A guy commits murder. He goes in front of the judge, and the judge says, I, I like your family. I'm going to let you go. I'm going to let it go. The guy comes before a judge, and the guy's guilty of bank robbery. And the judge says, see here, you robbed two banks. The guy says, yeah. Well, you know what? There were five more banks in that area. You didn't rob those. I'll let you go. Good. Okay? What? gives this king the right to forgive like that? What would give a judge the right? answer is nothing. We would call that a bad judge, right? A judge that doesn't uphold the law, seriously? Um, give you a break because, oh, you got a nice smile, you know. Say, oh yeah, you embezzled $20 million, but you gave a tenth to your local church, so we'll, <laughs> we'll let it go, right? Um, so, we have all these, these issues that come up with this, with this subject here. And he forgave him the debt. Okay, he walks away totally forgiven. This is a parable, which means it is a true-to-life story. It means, hypothetically, it could have happened, but it's, it's a fiction story. It's a story that designed usually to make one main point. This same servant, verse 28, went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. He laid hands on him, took him by the throat, saying, pay me what you owe. Okay? So he goes out, finds someone that, you know, I bought you a soda last week. You didn't give me my money. You owe me two bucks. He grabs him by the throat. So the obvious inconsistency is it's clear in the story. The fellow servant fell down at his feet and beside him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you everything. I, I got your money back home. I, I got your two dollars. <throat> but he would not wait. He went and cast him into prison. Don't you pay the debt? I owes me two bucks. The guy calls the cops and says, this guy stole money from me. Take him away. He wouldn't give me my two bucks when I wanted it. How can Peter forgive 70 times 7? By realizing the debt that God has paid for him. Right? He says, When his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry. And sorry then means very distraught. And came and told unto the Lord all that was done. The key here is fellow servant. When you slap me, you've committed a crime against me. I have every right to be vengeful, angry, upset, and my sense of justice kicks in, and I say you need to get slapped too. But that's like me getting upset at the guy that owes me two bucks. Have I done worse to God? And this is where the big lesson comes in for this reason number two. 
compared to the sins I've done against God in thought and deed. But whatever you do to me is nothing. If God can forgive me of my crimes against God, I can put up with the fact you stole something from me. There's nothing that a person can do to you that's worse than what you've done to God. And it's ugly but true. And when we start treating fellow servants like that, we are ignoring what God has done for us. Does that mean I let them get away with it? Well, God let me get away with it. So, I don't have the ability to forgive with uh, the tools I need yet, but I can at least understand the reason for it and even under understand the legitimacy of forgiving. Yes, if I've been forgiven $25 million, I can forgive you $2. Okay? So, it says, after that, then his Lord, after that, called him in and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all your debt that you requested. You asked to be forgiven of all your debt, and I forgave it. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? This is a parable, and the parable is that since I demonstrated mercy to you, you should have demonstrated mercy to your fellow servant. And the Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. This puts a big red flag in people's minds because they say, oh, I thought the Lord forgave him. And now he's taking it back, right? Oh, I thought your salvation was full and complete and eternal. And now it looks like this guy took it back. It's a parable. They're trying to teach us something here. I can only function in one of two ways in my life. I can function in grace or I can function in law. I can function in judgment or mercy. I can't really combine them. We've seen the problems with combining them. And I, I just, the fact that I'm made in God's image means I can't resolve this. When I live in grace, it is because Christ has paid for my sins. He's paid for my sins, and I am living in the freedom of that grace. The second I start to live in unforgiveness with somebody else, my conscience kicks in. So, what is our conscience? Our conscience, it did break it to you, our conscience does not tell us right from wrong. Our conscience does not tell us what is good and what is bad. Our conscience tells you that there is such a thing as good and bad. Our conscience tells us that there is such a thing as right and wrong. And when our conscience teaches us these things, we believe our conscience and we function as if it is absolutely right. No matter what a person does, they do it because they think it's the right thing to do. Right? Uh, Ravi Zacharias used to say, there are cultures in the world that think they should love their neighbor. And there are cultures that think they should eat their neighbor. And they both do it because they believe it's the right thing to do. Our conscience is... Outside of Christ, outside of salvation, our conscience is managed by our culture. It's managed by our own experiences. That's why children will eventually learn that slapping is wrong when someone slaps them and they go, wait a minute, that hurts. <laughs> I guess that's not a good thing after all. Okay, so our, our definition of right and wrong in our culture is often whatever is convenient for me, you know. That's inconvenient. You're wrong. And outside of God's Holy Spirit teaching and training our conscience, we're always going to be misguided by it. 
And that's what's tricky about a conscience because you know you're right because my conscience told me I was right. Your conscience is messed up. And it is, you're going to spend the rest of our life having our conscience healed, trained, and what was the thing that caused mankind to fall? They were already in God's image, right? The knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And Satan lied and says, when you eat this tree, you'll be like God. Actually, no, when you eat this tree, you're going to be like Satan. Eat this tree, you're going to all of a sudden have a background picture of right and wrong, and you're going to spend the rest of your life trying to navigate that. And Christians often spend their day saying, okay, today I'm going to be good. And then it messes up and it doesn't happen. Tomorrow I'm going to be good. Next, I'm going to be good. Then eventually we'll say, you know what, <laughs> I'm going to be bad today. I've had a tough time trying to be good, and I'm going to take a day off. You know, that's not going to happen, you know, or, you know, and, but that's because even as Christians, we're trying to function with a faulty conscience. And we're trying to function by choosing good and evil. That was the tree. That was the consequences. But as Christians, we live by God's spirit. His spirit fills us. His spirit gives us his thoughts. And we are constantly living, if we're living in the spirit, we're not thinking right and wrong. We're just following God's spirit. As a result, we start doing the right things. But we don't do right and wrong based on choosing to do right and wrong. We do right and wrong based on choosing to follow Christ. And following Christ, receiving his forgiveness, receiving his grace, actually causes us to behave better than other Christians who say, I'm going to do the right thing today. Because that's the trap. I'm going to either choose the good side of the tree of life, the good side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or the bad side of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Either way, I'm still eating that fruit. And we're not called to eat that fruit. We're called to never eat that fruit. We're called to have God's spirit from the inside out. Everything in the law is all external. We're given the internal. So, our second reason here, um, to finish this up, tormentors. What is the tormentor? I live in grace, I'm free, I'm happy, I'm content, and then I don't forgive Brother Miles when he does something to me. My conscience kicks in. I go, oh, that's our new definition of right and wrong. So in my mind, I'm thinking of all the ways I need to punish him. Because he did something wrong to me. We'll talk later. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but what does my conscience do? My conscience says, oh, that's how I'm supposed to live. And my conscience knows all the wicked things I've done in my entire life. It has a backlog. In the old man, in my old sin nature, it's in there. And my conscience starts to torture me. My conscience torments me. And that can manifest itself in depression. It can manifest itself in physical ailments. There are Christians who are sick today because they have unforgiveness in their hearts for some, someone else. And we're not going to be dwelling on it. Let's think about it. There is that one name that pops in your head right now when I say, if they walked into this room, you would suddenly seize up. You got an issue with them. Okay? And if that's in there, it's a canker worm. It's something that is going to trick your conscience into beating up on you in the way you deserve. And you're going to be tortured until everything's paid. Now, what's the best way to pay off that debt? Forgive Miles. Everybody, forgive Miles. Okay? You is it and that cleanse it. It puts my conscience back on a godly thing. Once again, being made in the image of God means that God wants me to become more like him all the time. You can't be more like God than you are when you're forgiving somebody. Okay? When I forgive somebody, I'm becoming like God. And I'm able to do that 
because that sin has been paid for. <clears throat> when I give grace to others, my conscience gives grace to me. And I'm, I'm restored. I'm back. So, let's go back to the Micah verse again. How can I love justice and show mercy? Says he has showed you, a man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? We realize that forgiveness cleanses my conscience. This dilemma is solved at the cross. I have to do justly. How can I do justly? How can I judge righteous judgment? By looking at my fellow servant and saying, God's paid for your sins. That's righteous judgment. Looking at an unsaved person and saying, God's paid for your sins. We treat the saved and the unsaved exactly the same. One because he's a potential saint, and one because he is a saint. And what's in the, what's the barrier for the unsaved person to, to become saved? What's the barrier? They have to accept the forgiveness. They have to receive it. And that's what we do on outreach all the time. You know what? You ask someone, how is your life? And no matter what they say, we have a solution for it. Okay? Guilt, shame, depression. Um, things going wrong. Well, there is a God. And then God has cleared the path for you to get to know him, for you to get to heaven. And, once that, and since that path is already clear, nothing you have to do but say, okay. That's what salvation is, giving assent to God's initiation. His Holy Spirit saying, I love you. I want you, I died for you, I paid for your sins, I want you to be with me in heaven for eternity. How about it? That is when God's Holy Spirit is convicting and calling every person on the planet right now in this special age of grace. Let's go to Ephesians 2. So we understand that by God, by Christ paying for everything on the cross, all debts are paid. That means justice is settled. Justice is taken care of. And those that don't receive the righteousness of God through that justice will receive justice eventually. That's another issue in our culture today. People become justice warriors because they don't fully understand that there is ultimate justice. Everybody's going to get theirs eventually if they don't receive Christ. Christ took the hit for everybody. But if you tell God, ah, I'd, rather you not, I'd rather not accept your payment for my sins, then you'll have the option to pay for them yourself. And that's God's fairness. If you don't, and that's the hardest question to answer for God. What does God do to someone that rejects mercy? At some point, He gives in, right? So, Ephesians 2, let's look at verse 7. I'll start with verse 4. I'm sorry. God is rich in mercy for His great love which he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. He quickened us. That means he resurrected us. Body, soul, and spirit. Unsaved person has a physical body, has a soul that's damaged, and a dead, defunct, dormant spirit. You get saved, your spirit is resurrected. You were dead, now you're alive. The Spirit comes in, takes control, and it begins to train your soul and your conscience, like we mentioned earlier. 
And eventually, your body follows suit. You start doing the right things. But it comes from the inside. It says, By grace you are saved, verse 6, He has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. This is the main verse here. He might show the exceeding riches. What is God's purpose for forgiveness? To show off. God says, I am so powerful. I'm so amazing. Angels, you thought making a universe out of nothing was impressive. Check this out. There's a person that sinned just like some of your angel buddies did. There's no hope for them. You went outside of perfection, you're guilty, and you're going to the lake of fire. That's what we, that, it was made for those angels. And the angels that didn't fall are aghast that there's a way out of this. And they look and see people like me and you doing stupid, horrible things, and God keeps forgiving us, because of the cross, and they're like, this is way beyond amazing. Yeah, creating a universe by speaking it, that's nothing. Letting me into heaven, that's a miracle. That's a big deal. So let's look at this verse a little more thoroughly. It says, in the ages to come, he might show. This word show means demonstrate. It means um, give evidence to expose and this is where we get this concept of trophies of grace. Every person in heaven is a trophy of grace. Every person is part of God's trophy case. And some of those trophies are bigger than others. And what constitutes a big trophy? Someone who had a big salvation. The worst sinner that gets saved only demonstrates how powerful God is. Okay? We should never, ever be upset at the idea of a horrible person getting saved. We don't ever want to have a thought of that person deserves to be in hell forever. Well, yeah, we all do. That's not the point. We should never say, I hope he burns. I see that online. People say, I hope that person burns in hell. No. God is not willing that any should perish. Since it's paid for, all God wants people to accept it. You know? So when the worst of the worst, when the Jeffrey Dahmers get saved, we go, oh, that's a great God. Okay? That's a great God. That's a nice trophy for his case. Right? That's the big trophy. He says you're going to show the exceeding riches. The exceeding here is go well beyond and surpass. If you can count your money, you're not rich. Just a little saying I thought of. <laughs> if, if you have money if you can't count your money we'll call that rich okay but if you count your money you can say this is how much money I have that's not rich rich is exceeding exceeding riches of God things you can't count <laughs> things that go beyond what we can think or imagine those are the exceeding riches of God and so our third reason for Forgiveness is the reason God gives us. Forgiveness demonstrates God's power. Forgiveness demonstrates God's glory. When we forgive, we demonstrate God's character and allow someone to become a trophy of grace. That doesn't resonate with us, but when that person does something wrong to me, I say, I forgive you, and I do it with the power of God, that person is receiving God's glory. That person is receiving a taste of what God wants to give them, especially if they're not saved. We forgive them. You know what? I love you. I forgive you. Won't you let God forgive you? Let's turn to 1 Peter 1. As we slowly come in for a landing here. 1 Peter 1. Uh, verse 10. Peter's been talking about 
salvation of your souls. And he says, regarding this salvation, or of which salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. He's talking about prophets in the Old Testament, writing about a new life, a new spirit, forgiveness, and the prophets themselves not fully understanding what they were writing. But in that writing, it says they were searching. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. When it testified before and the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So prophets wrote their writings and they said, well, the Messiah is coming. He's, he's going to suffer and then he's going to atone somehow. And, and God's going to be able to pour out grace on all humanity. And it was beyond their comprehension it doesn't make them it's beyond our comprehension too to be honest but this is something that is just so astounding something that is imperfect can be made perfect let's face it if 100% is perfection and something happens and drops down to 99 it can never get to 100 again right it just it can't is that you cannot get back to 100%. It's only by the miracle of the cross and the grace of God that he has declared us that. By the way, that's why we need brand new bodies in heaven. Because these aren't allowed. <laughs> okay? It is not. They're, they're, they're material. They're, they're part of this temporal universe. No place for them. And it says here, unto whom it was revealed... Not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things. So, the prophets are writing and they're saying, I'm not sure I understand this. And God says, don't worry, it's not for you, it's for the future. It's for you and me. That's why we love the Old Testament. All these things are there for our teaching and our edification. Minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven. Here it is which things the angels desire to look into. You start talking about forgiveness, you start talking about grace, angels come, they, just a second, they came rushing into this room. They said, we can't figure this thing out. Creation, yeah, we got that. God spoke, it happened. No big deal. That's yesterday's news. Someone got saved today. Another Christian forgave somebody today. How does this happen? Let's check it out. We are part of angel school. Angels have to go to angel college. And what they do is they study how we apply grace, how we receive grace. And it, it freaks them out. Because there's no, there's no frame of reference for it. They didn't fall. They know a holy God. They know what happens to things that do fall. The third of the angels that are on their way to hell. That's what happens when you go outside God's will. But us, God found a legal way around it. Remember, the judge that says, oh, it's okay, I'll wink at sin, is a bad judge. How does God maintain his status as a good judge? He paid the debt himself. Okay? You're sentenced to death. But I'll die for you. I'll die in your place. Justice is upheld. Mercy is allowed to, to continue. The angels look in on that. So, as we wrap up, we want to become more like Christ. And what does Christ do? Christ never beat people over the head with their sins. Only the self-righteous got a dose of that with the Pharisees who rejected him. What is Christ's message to the human race? Forgive them, they don't know what to do. What is Christ's message to the human race? How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God foreknew, he saw our free will acceptance of him, 
And at that point, he said, you're going to be like me. We will all become like him in heaven. But the joy and privilege we have today is to become more and more like him in this life. And we do that by receiving his spirit and receiving his guidance and forgiving people. I forgive people because God's got the plan worked out and I don't have to stress about it. We forgive people because it cleanses our own conscience. We forgive people because this is what God has done for us. And he's made us trophies of grace. Let's face it, we'll be walking in heaven someday and we're going to see someone and they're going to go, and we're going to say, wow, didn't expect to see you here. <laughs> right? <laughs> but then later on, someone's going to say, say, say the same thing to you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Whoa, I, I, have some, I have some bad news about you. I didn't think you were going to make it. Okay? So, trophies. Everyone in there is a trophy of grace because no one deserves to be there. And everybody that is there is because of the blood of the Lamb. Isaiah 30, 18, don't turn there, just says, God waits eagerly to show grace. If you want to be like God, spend your time looking around eagerly to show, eagerly to show mercy to somebody. We have an attitude of forgiveness. We forgive before someone does something wrong to us. Which leads us to our final question. Can Christians really forgive and forget? Isaiah 43, 25. Let's look at that real quickly. Isaiah 43, 25. Very famous verse here. I, God says, even I am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Why does God blot out our sins? Why does God forgive us? For his own sake. Number one, because he wants to. Number two, because his son paid for it. Justice is satisfied. Mercy is now free to be demonstrated. Will not remember your sins. If God can forgive and forget, we can too. Uh, we watched the movie, my wife and I, the, um, I Can Only Imagine. It's kind of a movie about that song. It's excellent. The guy has to go through a period of learning how to forgive a horrible, horrible father. And at one point, his father, who is very desperate, and at some point apparently has gotten saved because he listened to his son's songs and some of the sermons on the radio, is asking his son for forgiveness. And the kid says, no, uh huh. And the father is... The new new believer, he's just all ripped up inside, full of horrible, horrible guilt. And he just says, well, God can forgive me. And the kid says, yeah, God can, but I can't. We don't want to be in that position. And it happens. It's things we have to work on. It's, it's a learning process. But if God can forgive and forget, so can we. How can I forgive and totally, totally forget? I mean, i got a good memory. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's not, well, it's something. My wife might say other, otherwise, but memory. But forgive and forget. How can a person run over my foot, and the next time they come, I, I have no memory of them running over my foot? And the answer is in what Joseph did. God sent me to Egypt. He slowly had a memory being replaced in his mind. It was a memory of how God looked at it. God looked down. He didn't even see the sins of his brothers. God is looking down with total finished work on what his brothers did and working everything together for good. God's memory, if you will, of that situation is, oh yeah, I wanted to make sure Joseph came ahead of time to Egypt to save his family and help build a nation. Joseph, in God's mind, Put it this way, Joseph is expressing God's reality. The new man never remembers sin. God doesn't remember sin. When I'm living in the new man, when I'm living filled with the Spirit, I don't remember what anyone's done to me. And the same with all of you. 
If you do remember, that's part of the old man whispering in your ear saying, oh, here's a back, a historical thought. Here is um, an old line. These are things that God needs to heal. When I say I forgive somebody, I say, dear God, you give me the power to forgive. And when God gives you the power to forgive, he gives you the power to forget. And I can honestly say, I can't think of anything anyone's ever done to me. Until I go back to the old man. Okay, I can flip that on and off anytime I want to. And that's, that's how we function as Christians. We practice living in the new man, you know, and something comes up, you know, I mean, there are people I used to, my stomach would seize up when they walk into a room, and I don't think anything about it anymore. Now, anytime I want to go back and live in Adam, anytime I want to go back and reopen that tomb where he was killed and dead and buried, <laughs> and of course, the older I get, the worse he stinks, you know, I can go back, I can always dig up dirt and say, I remember when you did that to me. So yes, forgive and forget only applies in the new man. But that's where we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live with God consciousness. We're supposed to live with everything we talked about today as applying to forgiveness. I want to be more like Christ. I'm looking for opportunities to forgive. I'm looking for chances to give mercy to somebody to demonstrate who God really is, right? The lawgiver is only step one. Holiness is step one. That's ultimate. But our last verse Psalm 89.14 Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. God is never ever going to um, violate his justice. Never violate his holiness. But because of the cross, he is now able to demonstrate love and faithfulness to us. The love came. Christ came to earth. He paid for the sins, yours and mine. He cleared the path. He removed that dividing wall. And as a result, he is now free to demonstrate love and mercy. Something the angels could never have comprehended. They still can't comprehend it. They still can't get over how a holy God can say, I'll let it go. And still be holy. Love and faithfulness go before you. God sent his love to earth. That love lived a life, demonstrated God's faithfulness, paid our debts, atoned for our sins, satisfied God's holiness, satisfies God's justice. So now we can love justice because it's been paid for. We can show mercy because justice has been taken care of. And the third part of that verse is walk humbly before our God. The verse back in Micah. Walking humbly means I submit to what Christ has done for me. I submit to what to God's plan. And in walking humbly, I can then do both of the others. And there's no conflict anymore. Justice is taken care of. Mercy is who God is demonstrating now. In this age of grace, you and I are testaments of mercy and we can give it to others and as long as we walk humbly and receive that for ourselves and give it to others that verse is what God like it says if you want to make God happy that's the verse and today we talked about forgiveness for others next week we're talking about forgiveness for ourselves let's pray Lord Jesus just thank you so much that you showed the way. You made an example of yourself for us. Lay down our lives and walk humbly and be free to give forgiveness to others and to do so to glorify you. God, does anybody listening to my voice right now that has not received that free gift of forgiveness? If you're listening, Please pray this prayer right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for paying for my sins. Thank you for receiving me into your family. If you prayed that prayer, you're saved. You have given in to God's call and God has 
lifted you up, put you into his family with the rest of us, and you now are a trophy of grace. And if you're thinking you're too bad for God, realize God is looking for you because he wants an extra big trophy in that trophy case. Because God is a big God, much bigger than your sin. So Lord, we just pray that you would um, bless those of us that are here, keep us safe in our travels, keep us um, healthy, and we just thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Right. Thank you, Pastor. All right, this is the offering. Um, got, uh, Mr. Hunter will be passing the basket here. Those of you at home, if you would like to give to this ministry, you can go online, ggwo.org forward slash donate. Look for the missions and local needs button, and then on the mission specific, type in or select Owens Mills. Or you could write to us at Grace Family Fellowship, P.O. Box 1435, Owens Mills, Maryland, 211117. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And please stand. Father, we pray that you bless this time as we give in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Brother, you can go ahead and pass the basket. I have a little announcement. Those of you, we have a special Thursday night, which is August the 18th. Am I, am I correct? Yes. So Thursday night, uh, we, we have uh, our regular service from 6.30. And then afterwards, uh, we're going to have a little time together. It's family movie night. We're going to uh, have a Christian movie and some popcorn and stuff. So gives us an opportunity just to fellowship and be together a little longer. So that will be here at um, uh, Holiday Inn Express, 11509 Red Run Boulevard. That's August the 18th. Service will be at 630. The following will be a little movie. Have some popcorn and some, some soda. I'm from Pennsylvania. Pop. <laughs> we call it pop. <laughs> right. But uh, we'll have that there. Okay, so let's bow our heads with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. And we just thank you, Lord God, that for the forgiveness that you have taught us, are teaching us, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord God, for Pastor Seba, Lord, that is so willing to um, share with the things that uh, God, you have put on his heart. Now they're on our hearts. We pray, dear Lord, that you just work them deep in our hearts and in our, uh, in our lives and uh, that we will be walking in forgiveness, Lord God, that that will be something that will characterize us, Lord God. Uh, we just ask you would do this in the precious name of Jesus as we become more and more like you and walk like you. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen.